Okay, good morning. It is uh, wonderful being back here uh, in Deal and wonderful again seeing all of you. Um, I um, want to talk today a little bit about Migilat Echa. Later on in the morning, I want to talk about Echa Rabah, about the, uh, the Midrash on Echa. And pretty much I want to ask the same question in, uh, in both classes, arrive at somewhat different answers. And that is the question as to how we can find consolation in Echa. Now, I think the first thing that we have to say is, is that Echa is not a book of consolation. It's not intended to be a book of consolation. We're looking, or I certainly, I'm looking for consolation, but it is most certainly not Echa's intention to provide us with consolation. It is a book of grief. It's a book of grieving. It's a book of, of, of pain. It's a book of outrage. It's a book of uh, shame, right? It's a book in which we experience the emotions of Yerushalayim, the emotions of Am Yisrael, as they experience the Chorban, as they experience the destruction of Yerushalayim, the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, and the way in which they respond to that emotionally. Um, on the other hand, even though that is, I think, what the book is about, um, I, I'm interested in finding consolation in the book because we read the book for generations to come, right? So we read the book, we want to extrapolate from the book something that enables us to go on, right? Something that enables us to rehabilitate and recover, okay? Now, when I start by, by saying that it has not a book of consolation, it's not a book of nechama, it's important to note that the word nechama does appear in the book six times, okay? Five times in Perak Aleph, right, in the first chapter, every single time in the negative, ein la menachem, ein menachem li, right, over and over and over. I have no comforter. It appears once in Perak Bet as a rhetorical question, ma ashvelach v'anachamech, what can I compare you to <clears throat> so that I can offer you comfort? Where, where the answer is, of course, nothing, right? The answer of the question, <clears throat> of the rhetorical question, is that there is no comfort. Ki gadol kayam shivrech mi yir palach, right? As great as the sea is your brokenness. Who can, who can fix you? Who can console you, right? The book, of course, ends, even though it has, you know, this sort of Good moment towards the end. Right, return us to you, God. It, it still closes with a sigh of pain, a sigh of 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 despair. Right, you have surely rejected us. You have been greatly wrathful with us. Right, so it's not a good ending. It's not a book which seems designed to provide us with really uh, uh, any sort of good feeling as we conclude. Um, and still, I think that despite that, and and I think that Echa is very valuable. Uh, for what it is, right? For providing uh, Am Yisrael with a platform to experience its, uh, its, its, its emotions within the context of its relationship with God, right? So that, that's part of what's happening in the actual simple meaning of the book. And yet still I think it's important and legitimate to look for consolation in the book. First of all, because as we're gonna see later today, that's what Chazal do, right? That's what I wanna show you in Echa Rabbah, but I'm gonna leave that aside for now. And, and, and more importantly, because even though the book itself, I think, is a bit depressing and it is a bit of a downer, uh, still, it, it, it doesn't end there, right? The book is not the end of Am Yisrael's history. And by the way, that's a little bit surprising. It's surprising for so many reasons. It's surprising, first of all, because that's not what happens in the Northern Kingdom, right? When Malchut Yisrael is exiled, they never come back, right? They never come back en masse, certainly, and rebuild their community, right? So there's every reason for us to think and for Yerushalayim to think that after the exile of her city and after the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, they won't be coming back, right? And, and this is certainly, I think, one of the things that echoes throughout the book of Echa. So we hear in Perak Aleph, Nitanani Adonai Bidei Lo Uchal Kum, right? God has given me into the hands of one I, before whom I will never be able to get up again, right? There's a sense that there isn't going to be a recovery. That's what we feel, at least that Yerushalayim thinks. We have several indications of that throughout the book. And yet, of course, it's not 
the end of Am Yisrael's story. And so what I want to see if I can find is, do we have the strength for that recovery within the book, right? Even though the book itself states that they really think that there might be no hope. And by the way, the other reason that, uh, that, that Yerushalayim seems to be right in assuming that there isn't going to be any recovery, that there isn't going to be any restoration or rehabilitation for the community is because that was the general state of affairs in the ancient Near East, right? Cities came and cities went. Conquerors came in, destroyed the city, left it in ruins, and people moved on, right? In fact, in ancient Near Eastern literature, we have a whole genre of lamentations over the destructions of cities. And in the lamentation over the destruction of Sumer and Ur, the following thought is expressed. It says as follows, the verdict of the gods cannot be turned back or was, cre- was granted kingship, but it was not granted eternal reign. Its kingship and its reign has been cut off. Be not aggrieved, depart from your city. Right? In other words, it's done, it's over, move on. Right? That's the way it worked. And so in contrast to that scenario, we have Yerushalayim, which, it, which remains as a place that we continuously aspire to return to. So even though Echa doesn't, at least on, on the surface level, provide any sort of hope or any sort of consolation, I think if we dig deeply into the book, what we're going to find is the strength for the rehabilitation of the community is embedded within the book. And that's what I want to look for today. I think the secret of Am Yisrael's ability to go on, their ability to survive, is partially found in the book of Echa. Where do we find this consolation? Where do we find this hope in Echa? Which, as I said, is very much not a book that is trying to offer consolation. <clears throat> so I want to uh, um, uh, look primarily at the language of the book. That's what we do, right? We look at the language, the allusions that are hidden within the language in the book of Echa. Like all Tanakh books, the deeper we probe the language of the book of Echa, the better we're going to understand its messages. Okay? And what I want to suggest is, is that the book of Echa is providing hope by taking, I mean, the book of Echa, I'll start by saying, of course, is a book that takes place in the present, right? It's about what is happening today, what is happening now. But at the same time, as we experience the very difficult present that is taking place in the book of Echa, we also go backward to the past and we go forward to the future. And that ultimately, I think, is the secret of Am Yisrael's survival. This is, of course, the experience of every religious person. We live not just in the present, we live with the past, and we live with the future. We live in anticipation of the future and in remembrance of the past. And I think that this is pretty much what ultimately is going to offer Am Yisrael the ability to recover. By the way, we find this at the very end of the book in that, in that penultimate Pasuk, right? Hashiveni Hashem, Hashiveni Hashem Elecha Chadesh Yameinu Kekedem, right? It's a request for the future so that it should be like the past. Return us to you, God, and we will return. Renew our days as days of old, right? So we're sort of taking from the, the past and looking towards the future, and the fact that that can be part of our present. That ultimately is what enables us to survive the present. So that's what I want to do. I want to uh, take us a little bit to, to, to see how Echa uses the past and looks toward the future in order to provide the means for, cont- for, co- for continuity. Uh, the other thing, though, that I want to say is, is that uh, there is uh, a, a, another message in Echa, which is not just looking at the past and not just looking at the future, but also deriving strength from the present. Okay, which I think is perhaps the most surprising experience in Echa, where Judaism here, or the book of Echa here, is insisting that we must live in the present, that we must find meaning in the present, that we can't just dwell on the past and hope for the future, that we have to also be experiencing the events, no matter how difficult they are, and to be able to extract meaning in the here and now. Okay, so that's what I want to show you as well. All right, let's start with the past, which I think is um, 
certainly an important part of Echa. Uh, Echa is looking backward uh, every once in a while, not that frequently. The word Zachor, the word um, to remember, appears in the book a key seven times, right? So I think many of you have heard that any word that appears seven times is a key word. And the word Zachor does appear seven times in the book of Echa. Uh, for example, in Perak Aleph in Echa, Zachara Yerushalayim. Yemei onya umerudeha, right? Kol machamudeha sher hayula mimei kedem. Yerushalayim remembers in the days of her difficulty all of those wonderful, delightful treasures that she had in days of old. And so we recognize from that pasuk that part of what is giving Yerushalayim and Am Yisrael strength during the terrible indignities of destruction and calamity is her ability to draw on her past memories, her recollections of the past, which we have scattered throughout the book, even in the very first pasuk, Echaya Shavah Vadad, Ha'ir Rabati Am Hayata Ke'almana, Rabati, rabati Vagoim Sarati Bamedino Taital Amas, right, that city that was once so filled with people, that city that was once a prince among the people, right, so what are they remembering here? They're not necessarily talking about the fact that now Yerushalayim is empty. Now Yerushalayim is a widow. What are they also saying? Oh, we remember once when Yerushalayim was teeming with people. And so being able to recall past memories, <clears throat> that lends strength for the present. But I, I want to really actually draw your attention to a, a, a different aspect, a more subtle usage of the past. And that is that woven throughout the language of the book of Echa is an attempt to understand why these events happened. Okay, one of the big questions I think that we ask in the book of Echa is why? What does it mean that Yerushalayim has been destroyed? What does it mean that God has destroyed his own Mikdash? Do, do these events mean, and this is a critical question, that God has abandoned his nation, right? You look around, you see what has happened to Yerushalayim. You ask yourself, where has God gone? What does God want from us? Is Am Yisrael finished as a nation, right? These are the questions that echo in the background. They are unspoken. And I think that by, uh, by, by weaving into Echa, uh, this sort of subtle language, the, the book provides an answer, and that answer provides hope. What is the answer? What is, what is the language that I'm referring to? Well, the language of Echa illustrates that these events are not random, and they don't take place in a vacuum. They are the culmination of years of sinning, of years of warnings by the prophets, of years of attempts to try to get this community to do tshuva. And when Echa is written with explicit references to prophetic rebukes, Echa is offering a context for the book. It's saying, this, these aren't random events. This doesn't spell God's rejection. Ultimately, this is exactly what God said was going to happen. Let's look at a few examples of this that I brought for you here on the first page of the source sheet. I mean, you know, I had to limit myself. There are so many examples. I really tried to find some of them that I think are the most compelling ones, but we, we won't do all of them inside. Look, look at the second one. Look at this middle example in Yirmiyahu, Perak Yudalid. <coughs> Yirmiyahu here is, of course, prophesying at the time of the Chorban or, or just prior to the Chorban. And look at what he says. He says, This nation that is receiving these prophecies and obviously not listening to them are going to be sprawled out on the streets of Yerushalayim because of the hunger, because of the sword. There will be no one who will bury them. Just look ahead in Pasuk Yud Zayin. And you should say to them, you hear me out. Tell the people at the Davar Hazeh. My eyes flow with tears day and night. The Altid Mena, don't let them stop. Ki Shever Gadol Nishpira Betulat Bat Ami. 
for they have been broken with a great brokenness, the daughter of my nation. Makan nachla me'od, a terrible blow. Im yatsati hasadeh, v'hinei chalalei cherev. If I go out to the field, there are corpses that have been felled by the sword. V'im bati ha'ir, v'hinei tachlu'e ra'av. If I come into the city, I see people that are dying from hunger. If you look at the left side, what you're going to see is that Echa weaves in all of this language of Yirmiyahu's warnings into the actual events as they occur. So look on the left side. Michut shikla cherev, babayit kamavet. Outside we have the sword, inside we have death, presumably by famine. Look in Echa Perak Bet, the next one. Shachvu la'aretz chutzot. They're lying on the streets. Nar v'zakein the young and the old. And look at the next one. This is Yerushalayim speaking. Kalu v'dema'ot enai. My tears are stopped up in my eyes. Chumarmeru me'ai. My insides are churning. Nishpach la'aretz kvedi al shever bat ami. Because of the brokenness of the daughter of my, of my people. Horidi chanachal dim'a yomam valayla make your eyes flow day and night, right? You hear it? It's the same language. We have this mirroring of language. We have Echa weaving in the language of Yirmiyahu's admonitions, right? Yirmiyahu said, this is what's going to happen. Echa says, look and see, this is what happened. And when you pay attention to this, you see how Echa utilizes all of these prophetic rebukes in order to say, well, you know, there is an explanation for everything that happened. This isn't just some sort of random course of events. I think the most powerful one is what I brought for you here in Yechezkel Perak Zion. Yechezkel Perak Zion is probably the worst chapter in Yechezkel. Yechezkel is also a prophet during the time of the Chorban. And he describes in this chapter, maybe we'll just look at the bold uh, words so that we don't, so we can save time here. Right? He describes, Kates ba ha right? The end is here, the end. Look down a couple of uh, psukim. Velo echmol, says God, I will not pity. Eshpoch hamati. I'm just skipping over the bolded ones. You're following this? Yeah? I pour out my anger. I have consumed them in, in anger. Right? The sword is outside. Both the hunger and the plague are inside. Skip down to Pasuk Yotet. They throw their money in the streets. Of what worth is money when there's no food to be had? Uzehavam lenidai, and they don't they don't even want to touch their gold. Kaspam uzehavam lo yuchal lahatzilam biyom evrat Hashem. Their money, their gold, their silver cannot save them on the day of God's anger. And look at that last uh, uh, bolded line at the bottom. Al kain nitativ lahem lenida. Therefore. I will make them. I have made them as a uh, as a menstruant. Okay, so that's the description here. If you look at um, at, at at the Echa side, you see all of these words appearing again. So just look down. Um, oh, it, did it skip? Oh yeah, look at the beginning of the next page. Turn the page for a second. Look at the top of the next page, right? In Parak Dalid, Echa says, "Karav kitzenu malu yamenu." Kiva kitsenu, right? The end is near. Our days have ended. The end has come. This very much echoes what Yechezkel is telling them. Haketz ba, ba haketz. The end is coming. And of course, he is urging them to tshuva. And so this uh, um, echoing or this usage of Yechezkel's Perak Zion indicates once again exactly what I said before, which is that these events do not take place in a vacuum. They are very much what the prophets told the people was going to happen. Now, I had said before that I was looking for messages of comfort, right? This doesn't exactly sound like a message of consolation, but it is a message of consolation for, for several reasons. One of which, of course, is that it offers a framework for understanding the events. And, and perhaps more importantly, because it indicates to us that these events take place within the context of a relationship. 
They do not spell the end of the relationship. It does not mean that God no longer is interested in them. It does not mean that God has abandoned them. It means that this is part of the relationship. And that point, I think, is made perhaps most significantly by looking at this chart that I brought for you here in the middle of page two. We won't go through the chart. This, that's there for you to uh, look at on your own time. If you look at this chart, what we see is that Echa is not just echoing the recent prophetic rebuke, right, that we have in Yirmiyahu and in Yechezkel. He's also going either even farther back in time to echo the parasha that we colloquially term the tochacha, right, the rebuke, which is Devarim, Perek Kavchet. In Devarim Perek Kavchet, we have not a list of punishments, but a covenant, right? It's better termed, perhaps, a covenant, right? What is Devarim Perek Kavchet? God says to the people, if you do good and you obey me, I will give you the following wonderful rewards, right? Second half of the, of the chapter, if you do bad and you disobey me, I will give you the following punishments. And when you look at this chart, you see that those following punishments, they are implemented in Echa, right? So that if, if in uh, Devarim, Perak of Chet, God says, Ve'ata tered, mata mata, you will go down further and further downward. What does Echa tell us? Ve'atered pla'im. She spiraled down in a wondrous fashion. Right? So there's a, 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 a correlation that is being created between the events that happen in Echa and Am Yisrael violating the covenant that they had entered into of their own volition in Devarim, Perek Kafchet. The Chorban is the implementation of the punishments that God had told the people that he was going to bring upon them if they do not keep the covenant. Now again, it's not exactly consolation, but it certainly indicates that this story has meaning, that this story is part of a broader framework. And even perhaps more, significant, more significantly, that there is a formula for rehabilitation, right? If we say that these events took place because the people violated the covenant, so then how do we reverse the situation? Go back to the beginning of the chapter. Right? And understand that as soon as we restore our relationship with God and begin to obey God and to go back to our commitments in the covenant that we create with God in Devarim Perak of Chet, we will be able to restore the relationship once again. And, and the, the Megillah hints to this idea in the most, I think, subtle but potent way that the Tanakh uses to hint to ideas, and that is by weaving linguistically the language of Devarim Perak Kavchet into the language of Megillat Echa. By the way, there is another hint that this is the general attitude that eventually is going to accompany Am Yisrael in, you know, in, in their path of experiencing these punishments, and that is at the end of Perak Dalid, in the uh, last pasuk of Echa Perak Dalid, we're told, Tam avonech bat Zion lo yosif lahaglotech, right? When your sins uh, are finished, daughter of Zion, God will not continue to exile you. It takes them about four chapters to get to that conclusion, right? But eventually they do arrive at the conclusion that given the proper conditions, and those proper conditions are of course religious in nature, they are dependent upon our religious behavior, our relationship with God, we can restore our previous situation. And by the way, I think that this is very clearly what Rabbi Akiva was trying to say in the famous story with the foxes, right? Rabbi Akiva is walking up to Harabayit with his friends. Harabayit has recently been destroyed, right? And the friends see Harabayit and they see this fox running over the Kodesh Kodeshim, Shualim Hilchubo, right? And the, 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 the friends of Rabbi Akiva begin to cry and they rend their clothes and they, 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 uh, they bemoan their fate and Rabbi Akiva laughs, right? Remember this? The, at the end of Masechet Makot and the friends turn to Rabbi Akiva and they say, why are you laughing? And he says, because the prophecies of destruction came true. 
It's exactly what, what, what the prophet said. And, and therefore, if those prophecies came true, I am equally certain that the prophecies of consolation, that the prophecies of rebuilding will come true. And the, 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 the uh, Rabbi Akiva's friends turn to him and they say, Akiva nichamtanu, Akiva nichamtanu. You have surely comforted us. I think this is really what Rabbi Akiva is trying to say. When we look at Echa and we see the language from uh, past prophets and from the Tochacha in Devarim Perak of Chet, woven into the language of Echa, what we recognize is that just as these prophecies of destruction are implemented and brought to bear against the people, so too we know how to obtain those prophecies of comfort. And that, I think, is part of the message, the subtle message of consolation that we find in Migrat Echa. And now I want to turn our attention to the future, okay? Uh, how does Echa <coughs> turn our attention to the future? And, and just as I said, you know, um, about consolation, there isn't really much turning our attention to the future in a positive way in Echa. It's a book which is sort of noticeably absent of any kind of bold petition before God, right? Whereas, you know, I don't know, in Mizmori Tehilim, you might get all sorts of um, petitions during crisis, turning to God and saying, restore me and rebuild me and bring me back to Tzion. And you're not going to find that in Echa. You find very minimalistic requests at best. So the, the, the two kinds of requests that are scattered throughout the book are, number one, the request to God, Re'ei Hashem Vehabita, look God, see me, which of course is predicated on the assumption that God's not looking. It's a period of hester panim. God has turned away. And so in order to begin any sort of reconciliation between the people and God, they have to begin by saying to God, Look at me. Re'e Hashem Vabita appears in Perak Aleph. It appears in Perak Bet. It appears somewhat in Perak Gimel. It appears in Perak Hay. Right? This is the request. It's a minimal request. It's not rebuild Yerushalayim, right? By by a long stretch, right? That's one kind of request. The other request that pretty much closes every chapter in Echa is a call for vengeance against the enemies. Right? Take care of the evil enemies fix the situation of Rasha Vatovlo, right, of those evil, wicked ones who prosper. At the very end of the book, coming back for the third time to that pasuk, which I mentioned this morning, at the very end of the book, we have that, you know, sort of bold request. Restore our days as days of old. But Echa doesn't very much turn to God and make bold requests for the future. But when, again, when we look deeply at the language of Migilat Echa, we see that Echa shares linguistic connections, not just with prophets who are prophesying messages of despair and punishment and God's anger, but also shares a relationship with prophets who are prophesying messages of consolation and hope and tikkun and rehabilitation. And I think that Echa really maintains a fascinating relationship with these <clears throat> prophecies of comfort, which suggest that the future is still ahead, that there's a way to fix this situation. I'm going to bring for you uh, a few, what I think are very poignant examples. Um, do you have Tanakhs? Yeah, for those people who do have Tanakhs, this is definitely the time to take out the Tanakhs. I didn't want to make the, uh, the, the, the source sheet that long. Um, but while you're getting out your Tanakhs, I'll just draw your attention to source number three, which is um, a Midrash in Echa Rabbah, where Chazal pretty much seemed to point our attention to this relationship between Echa and the prophets who are prophesying messages of nechama, messages of consolation, Echa frames, uh, Echa Rabbah, sorry, frames this idea by bringing a list of connections between Echa and the Pirkei Nechama in Sefer Yeshayahu, the chapters of consolation in Sefer Yeshayahu. The Midrash basically says that before God brought the punishment, he already 
brought the potential for the cure. So we'll just read the very beginning of this midrash that appears here at the bottom of page two. Yirmiyahu Amar Bacho Tivke Balayla. Yirmiyahu said, she shall cry, surely cry in the night. Yeshayahu Amar Bacho Lo Tivke, right? You will not cry, right? So that's, I think, again, Chazal's uh, attendant. Uh, and they go on and on here, right? Yirmiyahu Amar Darche Tzion Avelot. The roads to Tzion are mourning. They are empty. They are bereft. Yeshayahu Amar Kol Kore Bamidbar Panu Derech Hashem. Clear the path of God. God is coming back on that same road to Yerushalayim. So again, it seems to be a dialogue. And if you continue reading throughout this Midrash, you see that the Midrash maintains this ongoing dialogue between Echa, which is describing something which is untenable and filled with despair, and Yeshayahu, who is providing the solution who is providing the tikkun, who is telling us that it's true. You know, she might be crying right now, but, you know, soon she won't be crying. It's true that today when you go out and you look at the roads, they are filled with despair and mourning. They are bereft of people. But very soon, that road will be filled by the people coming back, led by none other than God, right? So this is the kind of uh, conversation that is going on in this Midrash. In my mind, this means uh, that Chazal are recognizing that we should, be, it, we should be looking deeply into the language of Echa and the way that it converses with language of prophecies and of comfort. I want to show you how this works. Let's start with, um, I'll, I'll, I'll turn your attention to Echa, Perak Bet. Let's start with what I consider to be one of the most uh, uh, difficult passages in the book. And, you know, there, there are quite a few that contend for that title. But this is, this is a very difficult one. And it's, of course, the description of the children, right? The description of the children, I think, is always the one that is most uh, evocative and painful. And if you look in Perik Bal- Bet, Pasuk Yud Aleph, uh, you have Yerushalayim describing her tears. We, we read this a little bit before. Kaluva d'ma'ot enai chomar meru me'ai nishpach la'aretz kvedi al-tever batami. Right? My eyes stop up. My, my tears stop up in my eyes. My insides are churning. My insides are f- spilling onto the ground because of the brokenness of my people. Be'atef oleu v'yonek b'rchovot kirya. When the suckling and the child is languishing on the streets of the city. Why, is the, why are the children languishing? Because they have no food. Le'imotam yomru. To their mothers, they say, aye dagan vayayin. Where is grain? Where is wine? Behit atfam kechalal, birchavot ir. As they collapse like corpses on the streets of the city. Behishtapech nafsham. As they spill out their souls in the bosoms of their mother, right? So you see, this is a really painful pasuk. We hear the children speaking. The pasuk itself is surrounded by the mothers, right? Li'imotam yomru, el imotam. The mothers who are meant to protect their children, they don't have the means to provide their children with food, and the children are dying in the mother's arms. It doesn't really get worse than that. Look one more pasuk ahead. Uh, what happens is that Yerushalayim can't talk anymore, and so uh, the objective narrator comes in and turns to Yerushalayim and says, "Ma'i dech, ma damelach habat Yerushalayim, ma ashvelach va'anachamech." How can I possibly comfort you, betulat batzion? Look at the next metaphor. Ki gadol kayam shivrech mi yirpalach. For as great as the sea is your brokenness, who can cure you? Right? And it's a great metaphor, right? The sea is a great metaphor for the symbol of the irreparable brokenness of the city. It hints to the copious tears of Yerushalayim, the violent churning of the city, the vast an unbridgeable despair that can't even find place for rest. You can't put an anchor in the sea. This is the description of Yerushalayim's pain. The pain, of course, leads to a scenario in which we can't find comfort. The children dying in the streets represent the end of her future, the failure of the mothers, the unraveling of 
compassion, right? The mothers who have the rechem cannot act with rachamim, right? Rechem, the womb, is related to the word rachamim, which means compassion. The mothers, their compassion fails because there is no recourse, right? There are no resources. The city throughout the, the book and throughout this parak is described over and over falling to the ground, hurled to the ground by, by, by the situation, by God. Everybody's lying in the streets. Okay, now, having read this, I want to turn your attention to Yeshayahu, Perak Nun Aleph, okay? So let's go there to Yeshayahu, Perak Nun Aleph, and I want to, um, I want to note um, how Yeshayahu is dialoguing with these psukim, right? Um, and, and Yeshayahu, again, you know, we said before, that, uh, that, that Echa really doesn't offer very much comfort. But, you know, if you look at Yishayahu, Perk Yud Aleph, Pasuk Yud Bet, you see where I am? Anochi, Anochi, Hu Menachem Chem. I, I, I am his comfort, right? Or, or uh, um, is, is, is Am Yisrael's comfort. Let's skip down for a moment to Pasuk Tedvav. The Anochi, you see where I am? Nun Aleph Tedvav, right? Yeshayahu, chapter 51, verse 15. Va'anochi Hashem Elokecha, roga hayam, vayehemu galav, Hashem Tzvaot Shmo. You see it? I am God who can calm the sea, right? Even that sea that is churning, God can calm the sea. Look down in Pasuk Yud Zion. We're just skipping a little bit to save time. Hit orari, hit orari. Awaken, awaken. Call me Yerushalayim. Get up, Yerushalayim. Asher shatit miyad Hashem et kos chamato et kubat kos atarela. Shatit, matzit. You drank the cup of poison that God gave you. Get up. Shake yourself off. Ein menahela mikol banim yilada. There's nobody who can guide her from all of the children who she birthed. The ain machzik biada. There's nobody that's holding Yerushalayim's hand. Mikol banim gidela from all of the children that she raised. Shtaim hena korotayich mi anud la chashod vahashever vahara vahacherev mi anachameich. You have all these terrible things happening. Who can comfort you? Banaich ulfu. Your children fainted. Shachvu birosh kol chutzot. They were lying on every street corner, etc., etc., etc. Pasuk, um, <coughs> pasuk uh, kavbet. Ko amar Adonai, Adonai, ve'lohayich yariv amo. He neila kachti miadech et kos atarela. I've taken from your hand that cup of poison, et kubat kos chamati, the cup that represented my wrath. Lo tosifi lishtota od. You will no longer drink from it. I will place it in the hands of your tormentors. The ones who said to you, lie down. And we will walk over you. They made your backs like the, like the earth. And they walked over it. Uri, Uri, get up. Awaken. Leave she uzech tzion. Clothe yourselves with glory, Tzion. Leave she big day tifartech Yerushalayim ir hakodesh. Put on the clothes of your glory, Yerushalayim, the holy city. Kilo Yosif yevo od yevo vach od arel v'tamei he naari shake yourselves off me afar kumi shvi Yerushalayim etc etc. Okay, so I mean we could go on and on here with Yeshayahu, but I think that you see that God is saying it's going to be different, right? I will be your comforter. I will calm the sea. I will bring you back to life again. I will raise you from the dust. I will awaken you and I will revive your people. And th this conversation that's going on between Yeshayahu and Echa is one that is meant to echo in the ears of the biblical reader, okay? So I think, you know, maybe um, the community here has a better chance of it, right? Because I think you probably know Tanakh better than a lot of people um, in, in the, uh, here in the United States. But, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of, of using this kind of language is that it should evoke 
these associations, right? Uh, we should be hearing these other prophecies echoing in the backdrop as we read Mikilat Echa. So what we're accompanied with is not just the despair of the terrible description of the children lying in the streets, but Yeshayahu providing us with a uh, revival, with a rehabilitation of that scenario. I'm going to give you another example, which I think is, all, is actually a stunning example. Go back to Echa for a moment, right? Go back to Echa. And the two worst chapters in Echa, the two chapters that describe in, in the worst detail the, uh, the destruction and the terrible events are chapters 2 and 4. So if you now turn your attention to chapter 4, we have a very gory description of the Chorban, of blind people wandering in the streets, sullied by the uh, blood that is sort of flowing through the streets, Right, we have this description in Pasuk Yudalid, Na'u Ivrim Bachutzot. There are blind people that are wandering in the streets, Nigo'alu Badam. They are disgusted, they are, they are sullied by blood. Below Yuchlu Yig'u Vilvushehem. Nobody can touch their clothes. Right, remember, Yeshayahu said, take off those clothes, put on clothes of glory, right? Here we have the clothes that are sullied, that are contaminated by the blood in the streets. Suru tame kara'u lamo. Go away, impure one, they called to them. Suru suru al tigao. Go away, go away, don't touch. Who's speaking? There's something very, very unclear here, right? Who's speaking? It's, it's not the people of Yerushalayim because they're all contaminated. Look at the continuation of the Pasuk. I think it's incredibly astute. Ki natsu gam na'u amru bagoyim lo yosifu lagor. When they flitted from place to place and wandered among the nations of the world, the nations would look at them and say, you can't continue to live here. You're sullied by blood. Again, it's a metaphor, right? And, and it's an incredibly astute forecast of what happens to Am Yisrael as they wander through the diaspora, they are expelled unceremoniously from place after place. They are forced to swallow the terrible jeers, the terrible disgust that people, uh, dis that people have towards them because, of course, the nations of the world regard them as contaminated. They are contaminated by their own destruction. They are contaminated by their own collapse. And this description here, I think, is a very poignant description. They're contaminated by sin. They're contaminated by exile. They're contaminated by poverty. Suru tame karulamo. Suru suru al tigao. Okay, this again, I think, is a very evocative description. Turn to Yeshayahu Perk Nunbet. Let's see what happens to Yeshayahu, Yeshayahu Perk Nunbet. This is one of the really great prakim in Yeshayahu. It's always it's always a lot more fun to turn to Yeshayahu than to stay in Echa, so this is an opportunity to, uh, to get a little bit of um, uh, uplifting nivuot. <clears throat> Let's look in uh, Yeshayahu, Perak, Nun Bet. Let's start in, uh, in Pasuk Zayin. Okay? Ma navu ala arim raglei mevaser, mashmiya shalom, mevaser tov, mashmiya Yeshua, omer letzion malach Elohaich. How great! Is the is uh, is the sound of the of the one who is bringing news, who's who's running on the hills to bring good news. He's bringing news of peace. He's bringing news of good. He's telling Zion, your God is ruling once again. Right? They're lifting up their voices. They're singing. They're celebrating. Um, uh, right? There's a famous pasuk. Pitzchu burst out, Ranenu yachdav, everybody sing together, Chorvot Yerushalayim, you ruins of Yerushalayim, Ki nicham Hashem amo, Ga'al Yerushalayim, God is coming to comfort you, He's coming to save Yerushalayim, Chasaf Hashem at Zroa Kodsho, it's Yitziat Mitzrayim again, God has revealed His, his arm, Le'ene kol goyim, Vira'u kol afsei aret et Yeshuat Eloheinu, Everybody is seeing the salvations of God. Suru, suru. Tzeu misham tamei al tigau. Tzeu mitocha. Hibaru nosei klei Adonai. Did you hear it? 
Go, go away, go away. Get out of that contaminated place. Don't touch it anymore. What's the contaminated place? The, the, the galut, right? It's the opposite. You have to leave there because you are the pure ones. You are carrying the vessels of God. Hibaru, purify yourselves. Suru, suru, al tigau. If you don't see the connection between this pasuk and Echa Perik Dalid, you miss the whole point, right? The, the point is, is that we're hearing something in Echa Perik Dalid which is extremely demoralizing. I mean, it, it doesn't really get more demoralizing than that. We hear the echoes and the jeers of the nations who are looking at Am Yisrael with disgust, right? And with, you know, uh, w- without any desire to, ha- to be anywhere near them. And along comes Yishayel and reverses it completely. Right? He says, no, 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 it's the opposite. They're the contaminated ones. In order for you to continue, you have to now leave the Galut and go back and purify yourselves once again in Yerushalayim. It's an amazing conversation. I think that we, we have these examples over and over. If, uh, I'll go back for a moment to Rabbi Akiva, the famous story of Rabbi Akiva, right? when, when Rabbi Akiva says, well, you know, um, uh, 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 we, I, I believe that the prophecies of comfort are going to come true. So he alludes, uh, he, he, he describes which prophecy of comfort is, uh, he's alluding to, and that is the famous prophecy, one of my favorite prophecies in Tanakh, uh, uh, in Zechariah, this is what Rabbi Akiva says, right? The prophecy of Zechariah, where Zechariah says, Od yeshvu zkenim uzkenot birchovot Yerushalayim. There will yet be elderly people sitting in the streets of Yerushalayim. The ish mishanto biado merov yamim, right? Each person will become so elderly that they'll have to hold a staff. Urchovot ha'ir. And the streets of the city, yimale'u yiladim v'yiladot, misachakim birchovoteha. The streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in her streets. It's the opposite of what we saw in Echa Perak Bed. It's the reversal of the children who are dying in the streets because they have no joy and they have no food and they have no protection. There's one more example that I want to bring, and then I want to talk a little bit about the present. Right? So the last example, though, I, I, I can't miss. Right? And if you look at the end of Echa, <clears throat> look at the end of Echa in Echa Perak Hey, um, at the very end, your Shalim is sort of you know bringing this story to a close and and uh, you know sort of uh, trying to uh, evaluate what has happened. And in pasuk Yud Chet, um, your Shalim says, "Al Hartzion Shemaim Shualim Hilchuba." You know, Hartzion is desolate. There are foxes going there, and suddenly turns to God and says, "Ata Hashem Leolam Teishev Kisacha Lidor." Vador, you God, you're forever. Your throne will be forever. Why should you forget us forever? Will you forsake us forever? It's a rhetorical question. You God are forever and you won't forsake us forever. So it's going to be fine. Right? But it's sort of kind of elliptical, right? He has these two sentences and where are they coming from and where are they taking us to? So I want to suggest that when you look at this pasuk, Ata Hashem Leolam Teshev, you are meant to remember uh, the exact parallel pasuk that appears in what I think is an extraordinary mizmor, mizmor kuf bet. Are you thinking that? Okay, look, there you go. I said, you, you're the ones who are, who are going to make these associations. You're meant to think of kuf bet. Turn to kuf bet. This is an amazing mizmor. <clears throat> Kuf bed. It's an amazing mizmor for so many reasons, but mostly I think because it's it, it, it really seems to be written about today, right? It really seems to be written about the past hundred years of Jewish history. It starts out with an incredibly terrible des- description of destruction, right? Where the people turn to God and says, "Shimat filati v'shavati elecha tavo." Right? Listen, God, to my cries. It's been terrible. Pasuk dalid ki chalu v'ashan yamai. My days have ended, shall we say, in the chimneys, right? That's what it says here. The atzmotai kimoke nicharu. And my bones have been burned on the pier, right? It just has real Holocaust, I think, you know, it, evocations. It goes, you know, this goes on and on like this. Turn to Pasuka uh, Yud. Ki efer kalechem achalti. I ate my bread, it tasted like dust. 
I was, I was drinking my own tears, right? It's just been really terrible. It's because of your, your wrath. You were carrying me, and then you threw me on the ground. My days are lengthening like a shadow. And I'm going to dry up like the grass. You see it? Suddenly, in the middle of all of this, you turn to God and say, You, God, are forever. Look what happens next. We've left 1945, we're in 1948. You, God, will revive Zion. The time has come. The period has come to rebuild. The whole world will see now God's glory. You see it, right? That pasuk was a turnaround. Now, Echa, we don't have the turnaround, right? I mean, you know, in our generation, I think we have the turnaround. It goes on and on like that. If, if I had more time, I'd read the whole parak with you. It's an amazing parak. But what Echa leaves us with hanging is that moment of revelation, that atashem lo'olam teshev, kisachal l'dor v'ador. Now, because we know te'ilim kuf bet, we know what's going to happen right after we close Echa, Right? In other words, Echa is not providing consolation. But when we hear the echoes of other books as we read through Echa, we sort of absorb the potential for restoration. Now, I have three minutes left to talk about the most, what I think is the most important point, but that sometimes happens. Okay, so um, the, the, the real message of Echa, and you know, we, 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 we've, we've seen two things here. We've seen how Echa sort of incorporates messages from the past in order to give us a framework for understanding that this is part of the relationship. It also incorporates messages that bring us toward the future to indicate to us that this is not the end of the story, that there is going to be a, con- uh, a continuation here. But I think that the real message of Echa, and maybe, the, I don't know if it's the real message, but the most extraordinary message of Echa is how to find strength in the present. And the Megillah does not really dwell very much in the past, and it doesn't really look too hopefully towards the future. We can extrapolate, we can mine that, we can extract it from the book, but really the book itself is mired in a dismal present, which is overwhelming and frightening, which is discouraging, and seems to be pretty much devoid of any hope. And yet, if you peel away the layers of despair and confusion, and pain, what I think you do find in Echa is a certain kind of clarity and hope. And when I say peel away the layers of, um, of pain, I'm talking about structurally, right? I think that the, it's possible the last time I spoke here at this Yomiyun, I spoke about the structure of the book. Is that possible? Yes, yeah, so I spoke about the structure of the book. I'm not expecting you to, you to remember, but I spoke about how um, Prakim Aleph and Hey, chapters one and five are very similar language very similar tones, very similar kinds of chapters. They represent an experience that deals with the pain of loss and emptiness that accompanies destruction. I talked about how chapters two and four are books that deal with anger, right? And that are, more, are louder books, they're, they're, they're louder chapters. They, they, they talk about confusion and, and, the, and the, the bewilderment and the sense of tzaddik viralo, right? So these are chapters that are filled with pain and anger. But when you look at the structural center of the book, I think you're going to see something different. When you look at Parag Gimel, you have the story of the suffering gever, right? The suffering gever. Ani ha-gever ra'a oni t'shevet evrato. And when you look at this gever, right, you see I brought it for you here in, uh, on page number three that the structure of chapter three starts with the suffering gever and it ends with the suffering gever, but in the middle we have the thoughts of the gever. And what is the gever thinking about 
He is reflecting upon God. He is reflecting upon God's kindness, upon God's compassion, upon God's fidelity, upon God's commitment to his people. That's what's happening at the structural center of the book. This isn't happening in the future, and it's not happening in the past. It is happening in the present. When you peel away the layers of anger and confusion in Migilat Echa, you're going to find at the center strength. You're going to find at the center a tremendous amount of faith in God's goodness. And that itself, I think, is something truly extraordinary. When we look at that center section, we see something else, which I'll just sort of briefly mention because I don't, I, I don't have time to really properly develop it, but you're going to see something else, which is that the Gever himself <coughs> uses the word tov three times in a row, right? We have a three-time alphabet, aleph, 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 bet, bet, bet. All the tet psukim start with the word tov, tov. Tov, that's very rare, right? Most of, the, most of the psukim don't start with the same word over and over and over. Oh, what are we finding at the center of this Gever's experience? He finds Tov, Tov. Tov la Gever ki sa ol bin urav. It is good for a person to bear a burden. He finds something deep. He finds something strong. What happens at the core of this very bleak book is that the suffering individual seeks and finds goodness. He finds hope in God. He draws on deep inner spiritual resources that enable him to find faith, to find meaning, to find the will to go on, to emerge reinvigorated and strengthened despite the grim reality that surrounds him. I think that what this book is suggesting is that at the core of Am Yisrael, at the core of the individual, lie the resources to find and reinvent and recreate his relationship with God, even when what swirls around him is a world that is filled with grief, that is filled with confusion, right? All the events of Migilat Echa, revolve around this contemplative center, which I think really mirrors the contemplative center that exists at the core of every individual Jew. And I think that what is being suggested here is that at the heart of human experience, uh, religious human experience, lies conviction, courage, and confidence in God and can, find, can help people to find meaning even in a very difficult present. So I would like to just conclude by returning briefly to Tehillim Perak Kufbet with the observation that we seem to find ourselves uh, today at, I hope, I believe, towards the end of that mizmor, perhaps in a post-Echa world, uh, per, presumably or, or, or hopefully, in a world in which Shama Hashem and Kat Asir God has heard the cries of the prisoners, Bana Hashem et Zion. God has begun to rebuild Zion. He kavets amim yachdav. God has begun to gather the nations into Zion. And we should be zoche l'saper shem Hashem et Zion u'tilato Thank you.